Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at Central Church of Christ for our Sunday morning worship service. It's such a joy to have you join in and worship with us in this online fashion. Uh, we have started, as we've mentioned, we've started meeting again on a one service Sunday basis where we're meeting at 10 a.m. to uh, have a worship service to praise God and to uh, study in his word in, in a safe and healthy manner. But uh, if we're if some of us are still waiting and, and uh, trying to keep a uh, an understanding of how things are going with the COVID-19 ordeal and, and are deciding to worship from home, that's that's okay. That is within your own right and your conviction, and there's nothing wrong with that. And that's why we're still going to continue to put up sermons that uh, will be preached on Sunday and, and uh, as well as online so that we can all worship together in a manner that we're uh, growing together and studying the same topics and subjects together. And that, with that in mind, that's what we're going to do this morning. But before we begin, we do need to take some time and, and uh, set aside a devotion for the Lord's Supper. So if you'll open with me to the book of Romans, chapter 6, that's where we're going to spend our time in preparing our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning. Romans chapter 6. And we're going to begin in verse 12. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. This passage is fascinating on so many accounts, but I really just want to focus on one idea. Paul, the author of Romans, is writing about how if the, if the law is what guides the people or if grace is what guides them. He says that's, that's not what it all is at all. You've been saved by grace through Jesus. And because you've been saved, the, the law is not there uh, to, to control you. It's not there to, to uh, guide you as it once have, has been. It's not what saves you. He's saying, now that you've been saved by grace, if you look in verse 16, now you've been saved by grace, you become slaves to whatever you want, to whatever you, you focus on. And he's saying that if you focus on sin, if you allow your bodies to, to be driven by wickedness and evil and sinful desires, then you are slaves to that sin. And that leads, as he writes, to death. Or the other option is you become slaves to righteousness, slaves to obedience. And that's what, hopefully, as we're, we're studying to partake of the Lord's Supper, that's what we have put, decided to do with our lives, that we've been baptized, we've obeyed the gospel for the remission of our sins, and we have decided to become obedient slaves to God. And I know slavery has this, a, a negative connotation. And in our history, in the history of the United States, and, and really in the world, slavery does have this negative aspect to it. But what Paul is saying is that our heart controls us. And if our heart is set on sin to do wickedness and act as if God's grace will continually be there, that, that we can continue sinning so that God's grace will continue to, to have a job to do, so to speak, then we're slaves to that sin and not slaves to obeying God or, or even focused on doing right. But if we're focused on obeying God, if our hearts are set on pleasing Him and obeying Him as they should be, then we will receive that grace that has been given to us through Jesus' death on the cross, and we will be saved, saved. And that's what makes us slaves, so to speak, is that our hearts become set on something. And hopefully we're setting them on things that will do right, that, that we will obey God, that we will live faithfully, and we will be saved because we are living by a, a heart that is focused on Jesus. And I know it, this passage really doesn't have anything to do, so to speak, with the Lord's Supper and why we partake of it. But it gives us a reminder of what we do after we are baptized. Because so often we may think that once we're baptized, that's it. We can continue living as we once were, that, that now that we're baptized, everything's wiped clean and everything will be wiped clean. But that's not always the case. Or, and, and not even always, that isn't the case. The case is simple. That once we're baptized, we have decided to put on Christ, to do what is right, 
to, to obey God, to continue following him in a way that will please him. And so we have to, to understand that we are committing our lives to him, committing each day to wake up and obey his will, committing each day to, to be kind to one another, to study in the word, to uplift one another. And as we remember Jesus' death on the cross, we remember that commitment we have made. And we partake of the Lord's Supper to remind ourselves that that commitment is still valid and still in control of our lives. Will you pray with me about that? Heavenly Father, we come to you now, preparing to take the Lord's Supper. As we partake and as we uh, ready our minds for this, Father, I pray that you'll guide us. Guide our thoughts to that commitment we have made to you, that commitment to do your will, to obey and live faithfully in all that we do. We pray that you will uh, strengthen that commitment within each one of us, that you'll help us to wake up each morning and dwell on that thought first and foremost. But right now, now Lord, we pray that you'll Help us remember that commitment as we partake of this Lord's Supper, a, a symbol of your Son's death for us, for our sins, so that we have salvation with you. Father, I pray that as we partake of the cup and of the bread, that we will partake of it in a manner that pleases you, that glorifies you in every aspect, and that you'll bless it before us. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Go ahead and pause the video this time so you can partake of the Lord's Supper. And we also offer this opportunity to, uh, if we were in the building at this time, to, to lay by in store, to give back of what God has blessed us with. And if you would like to contribute to the work of the kingdom here in Charlotte, please reach out to one of our elders and they will help you with that aspect. If you will, go ahead and open with me to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 4, and that's where we're going to have our lesson for the day. 2 Kings chapter 4. Again, I welcome you to our worship service here in Central and, and our online services. I, I hope that your week has been going well, that everything is, is looking up, and I hope that you are ready to, to dive into this study here in 2 Kings chapter 4. In 2 Kings chapter 4, we have a story regarding Elisha. Elisha is a prophet of God, and he's chosen to deliver the message of God to God's people, the Israelites. And here in this story, what we're going to see is we're going to see him passing through a northern city of Israel, called Shunem. And if you will look with me in 2 Kings chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 8. One day Elisha went on to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived, who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair and a lamp, so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. On One day he came there, and he turned into the chamber and rested there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. When he had called her, she stood before him. And she, he said to him, Say now to her, See, you have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king, or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, when is, What then is to be done for you? Gehazi answered, Well, she has no son, and her husband is old. He said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. And he said, At this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my lord, O man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived, and she bore a son about the same time following spring, as Elisha had said to her. <coughs> Elisha passes through this land, this land of Shunem. And we see that he has a almost habit of doing so, that he continues to pass back and forth because he develops this relationship with this Shunammite woman and her husband. And he gets to a point where this wealthy, this wealthy couple decides to care for him. They build an extra room on their house so that when he's passing through, he has a, a bed to lie in, a, a room to study God's word and to read or, or dwell in so that he doesn't have to worry about that when he passes through. And this kindness elicits a response from Elisha. He, he asks what he can do for her. He sends his servant to find out what he can do for her. And eventually he settles on this, this solution. She has been barren. Her husband and her have no son. And he is able to promise to her through God that she will have a son the next year. Now, this relationship between this family and Elisha is a wonderful example to us. We see kindness on both parts. And a relationship that grows because of it. But not only that, we see a relationship that will continue past these rewards and acts of kindness. Because it is a relationship that blossoms in trust. 
This morning, we're going to study lessons from a bed and breakfast. In our culture, a bed and breakfast has become one of the best ways to travel. They are often easy to find and give us confidence in their care. We have apps to find these bed and breakfasts, and we often choose them over hotels and motels because they're, they're somewhat simpler. We know that it's going to be easy and well done and that we'll be able to basically go in and out without having to deal with any hassle. We trust that the owner of these bed and breakfasts will, will be uh, good. And when finding a bed and breakfast, no, but when finding a bed and breakfast, it requires something that a hotel may not. Because when we go to a hotel, we, we know that it's run by a corporation or a company, and we know that they have chains all over, and that they, they have a certain uh, aspect, their, their, each hotel will be the same. But when we do a bed and breakfast, it requires a trust that that owner of that bed and breakfast, whether it's a family, whether it's a couple, whether it's a single person, that they are going to take care of this bed and breakfast in a way that shows uh, care for their their uh, visitors, that, that shows uh, that they value their, their service and whatnot. And most bed and breakfasts require a level of trust from the customers. Trust that the rooms will be comfortable. Trust that they're going to be well kept and not infested with bugs. Trust that the food will be good, that, that the host will be kind and caring. Trust is at the basis of any good bed and breakfast. And it's a trust that we see here in this passage. And I call it a bed and breakfast because what we see is that Elisha is staying in the house that other people are living in. But they have built a separate room to host him. So in aspect, it is a bed and breakfast. He stays there on his travels so that he can get from one place to another without worrying about where he's going to sleep. Now this story shows us different levels of trust. There's trust between the Shunammite couple and Elisha. There's trust between Elisha and his servant Gehazi. And there's trust between all parties and God. This bed and breakfast not only shows us kindness and care for others, but it shows us why trust is an important foundation for all relationships. Because without trust, we don't open up to others and ask for help because we fear that they're going to burn us. Without trust, we don't offer help to others because we fear we won't be appreciated. Without trust, we're angered at the trials we face because we just can't see a way out. Trust is one of the most important things that we can grow in a relationship. And it's important for us to value it properly. Because in this, in this story, we see what trust does for both parties, for all the parties. If you look back with me in verse, uh, verse 8. In verse 8, what we see is that trust creates kindness. One day, Elisha went on to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there and eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp, so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. One day he came there and he turned into the chamber and rested there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call the Shunammite. When he had called her, she stood before him and he said to her, or said to him, Say now to her, See, you have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? Trust creates this kindness. And if you look at what happens with the main characters in the story, you can see that. It starts from the very beginning when Elisha first visits this Shunammite couple. She gives him a meal. Now, Elisha eats that meal trusting that it's not going to be poisoned, that it's not going to make him sick, that it's not something that will, will slow down his travels in any ways. He eats it with trust that it is something that will nourish him, strengthen him for the rest of his journey. And on top of this, as this grows, that trust continues into a form where he continues to come back to this house on his journey. That whenever he's passing through, he makes it a point to go visit them, to go stay with them, because he trusts that they will help him. He trusts in their kindness. And likewise, that trust, it goes both ways. The Shunammite woman and her husband trust that Elisha is not just some other vagabond running through the, the hills that's going to create trouble or, or strife for them. They trust that Elisha is this man of God, that he is going to, to do good, and that helping him shows their, their love and devotion for God in some way. Now remember, this is a, a city in Israel, so they, they understand the law, they understand uh, the way people are supposed to act a host. But they go out of their way to be kind because they trust who Elisha is. And this all boils up 
after they build this room for Elisha to live in. This all boils up to Elisha's ultimate kindness. And I say Elisha's kindness, but we know it's God being kind through or, or working his power through Elisha. Elisha promises in verse 14 that or in verse 15, that the Shunammite woman and her husband, who have been previously barren, are going to have a child. Not only are they going to have a child, but it'll be in less than a year. It's a wonderful thing that, that this is, is building off of it from each other. That one act of kindness comes from one stage of trust, and it just continues to build and build until this ultimate kindness happens. And if we think about it in our own lives, we can see how this works. I, I trust my family. I trust my spouse, I trust I, I trust my son, I, I trust everything. And I, I say I trust my son even though he's six months and can't really do much. But I trust my spouse that she will look out for me. She will care for me, she will uh, make sure I am staying on the straight and narrow, she will uh, pick me back up when I fall, she will criticize me and, and fix problems that need to be fixed in my life. And likewise, she trusts me to do the same. She trusts me to care for her, to protect her. She trusts me to help her when she's struggling and when she's uh, falling down. She help, She trusts me to, to put her and then guide her on the path towards heaven. And it's that mutual trust that we have where it creates kindness. My trust for her and what she is, is, is able to do for me and what she will do for me is shown in acts of kindness. Maybe that's doing the dishes one night. Maybe that's vacuuming the, the, the living room because she's had a hard day. Maybe that's sweeping up. Maybe that's just doing something small because I want to show her that I trust in what she's doing. I trust my church family. I trust my brothers and sisters that, that they're going to look out for me, my spiritual well-being. And because of that trust, I desire to help them in any way. I want to help them with meals, with places to stay, with rides to anywhere they need it, with, with my time, my energy, because I want them to know that I love them just as much as they love me. And I trust them, and I hope that they trust me. Because of my trust in my spiritual family, I have this kindness that comes out. And I hope you've seen it. I hope you've, you've recognized it. And if not, please tell me, because that means I need to be working on it. I need to, to show it in other aspects. Thirdly, I, I, this is shown in the way that I trust people that I meet. I may have known them before or, or, or known their name, or I may have just known them. Yet there is this inherent trust that my trust isn't wrong. There is inherent trust that, that the other person I'm meeting, I can help them out. I can be kind to them. And it's not going to hurt me. It's not going to cause me any problems. It's not going to create any issues. If I just show some kindness to a stranger coming through my town or, or my, my life. But yet, even in any of those aspects, we still struggle. We still have times where it's not easy to do this. I mean, look through the story. It's, it could have been very easy for the Shunammite woman to ignore this stranger Elisha passing through the city because she had only heard about him. And she doesn't want to invite this, this strange man into her home just because she's heard about him. She could have easily ignored him and put her efforts and trust more easily into the people that she knew or, or, or recognized. And if we think about that in our lives, we have a very hard time trusting people that we have never met before. Whether it's a visitor in church services, whether it's someone who knocks on our door because their car has broken down, whether it's someone who's at a gas station and asks for help to get somewhere uh, that they're going, we have a hard time trusting people. Sometimes it's because of, of broken trust. Maybe there have been instances in our life where we've been in that same exact scenario and someone has damaged it and, said, and, and they've asked us for help and, and we look around and we help them and, and all of a sudden that help we've given to them has been being taken advantage of. Sometimes it's because we're, we're fearful of stories that we've heard where others have been hurt by strangers because they've trusted in them. Maybe it's a, a physical pain. Maybe it's just an emotional pain. But that pain or that hurt is given to us because we hear these stories from people that we trust about others that they have just made, met. And while I'm not saying that we should abandon all caution and how we approach strangers or those we've just met, I am saying that we are a, a, a little more closed off than we need to be. We should have a, a more trusting disposition of the world, of, of those around us, instead of just a withdrawn and fearful mindset. And again, that's not saying throw caution to the wind and, and throw away any idea of protection or anything like that. It's saying, open up that kindness in our heart. Open up that trust for others, because we see that in Jesus. Jesus trusted in his Father, 
and he has saved many, many people that he, has, that he has never physically met, but yet he knows. He has saved them because he, he trusts in the will of his Father. Now, when we think about strengthening this trust in our life, when we think about doing what the Shunammite woman does or what Elisha does, think about how great our relationships can be when we truly trust others. When I trust you and I am kind and caring for you and what you need, it's only going to strengthen our relationship because you will see that I am doing as much as I can to help you out. And in turn, hopefully that, that stirs something up in you to help others and, and, and have that same kind of kindness. And if our relationship is built on trust, then I'm going to be confident in what I can tell you and what I can confide in you and what I can ask of you. My trust and kindness will build this strong relationship of, of edification and encouragement because we know that we're both trying to help each other grow in the Lord. We see this in, in different passages in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did you see, we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Our kindness and trust extended to strangers is how we become not only more like Christ, but how we can show kindness to our Savior. Because we, we've read the passages, we've seen the stories of Abraham and other stories in, in the Old Testament. Unwittingly, people have helped angels who have come to visit them by just being kind and using their trust in, in that, that kindness and paying it off. And, and when we want to overcome the struggles we have of, of shutting that down or rejecting that idea, we can look in the New Testament for ways to overcome that. In Luke 13, it says this, now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are free from your disability. And he laid his hands on her. Immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. Jesus shows us how we should handle strangers. Now, we can't do miracles. We understand that. But the way Jesus sees this woman in need and finds a way to help her, not knowing her, not having met her before, is an example to us that we can extend that same kind of kindness to others. And it's shown multiple times. In Mark 5, we see this. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him. This is right after a woman touches his rope. Perceiving that power had gone out from him, immediately turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garment? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your disease. I chose this passage because this is a story where this woman has been bleeding for, for her entire life. And she thinks that if she just touches Jesus's robe, she'll be healed. And so she does it, and Jesus immediately knows power has gone out from him, and he turns around, and, and you can imagine that he could have been yelling, he could have been extremely mad that someone stole power from him. But instead he turns around, sees this woman's faith and trust in him, and has kindness on a stranger. When we think about ourselves, this looks like, in our lives, different things. It may look like us helping out people that we meet who are in need without a question of their motives. It may look like us being kind to those that we can be. And not holding anything against someone else just because of something that might have happened to us years before. It may look like us allowing trust to rule my relationships and not caution or, or skepticism. When we learn the lesson from the bed and breakfast that trust creates kindness, our relationships, our lives will seem so much more easy because stress will go away. Or at least some of it. The second thing that the, the bed and breakfast teaches us is that trust overcomes doubts. In verse 15, look with me, please. He said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. And he said, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your servant. 
But the woman conceived, and she bore a son about the time the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, O my head, my head. The father said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, and shut the door behind him, and went out. Then she called her husband and said, Send to me one of the servants and one of the donkeys, that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, Why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. She said, All is well. Then she sat on the donkey, and she said to her servant, Urge the animal on. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi his servant, Look, there is the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, Is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with your child? And she said, All is well. And when she came to the mountain of the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. And Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, Leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, Did I, did I not ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? He said to Gehazi, Tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. And, and we'll pause there. Trust overcomes doubts. The woman doubts at first that she will have a son. Because that's what Elisha's promised her. And she, she says, don't deceive her. Don't, don't lie to her. There's a semblance of doubt in what she says. And Elisha should not be teasing her over what she desires. If she does bear a son, she does have a kid. And her trust is strengthened in God and in Elisha. And we see then that this trust grows in her life. The son of the couple, now grown, goes out to work with his father in the fields. Yet he falls ill. He has something wrong with his head. Maybe it's a tumor. Maybe it's heat stroke. Anything like that. But he falls ill and he goes home and he dies in his mother's lap. The Shunammite woman does not turn from God, though. She does not curse him. She does not run away or, or cast anger upon him. And says she trusts that if she goes to Elisha, she will be helped. Something will happen. When, when we look in this story, when we see how that works out, and we will continue to look on. But when she see, we see how she runs to, to Elisha. She doesn't let anything stop her. She saddles her donkey. She gets her servant. And they go immediately to Mount Carmel. She is not letting doubt stop her. Because she trusts. She has complete trust in Elisha. When we think of our lives, it can be the very same way. That when I trust in someone, that my trust in them will overcome doubts and have. My trust in my wife helps me overcome doubts that I may have. That if... Uh, if, I'm, if I'm going to have dinner that night or if I'm going to, to have to fend for myself, that my wife will care for me and lift me up when I fall down or if I'm going to have to struggle on my own. My trust in my wife will overcome those doubts. My trust in my coworkers will overcome doubts that I may have about a project being finished or done to the best of their abilities. My trust in my spiritual family will help me to overcome doubts that I might have that, that come from spiritual tests or trials. Trust in others helps me to overcome doubts that might have crept in because I know that the others around me that God has blessed me with will help me, that will overcome. The Shunammite woman trusts in Elisha, and it helps her overcome doubts that she might have had, even about having a child. Later on in the story, Elisha's servant Gehazi trusts in his master in verse 30 through 31, even when what his master had commanded him to do for the dead child doesn't work. Gehazi still trusts that Elisha said what was right. And he has he may have doubts, but they are overcome with that trust in his master. Trust is shown to overcome in his doubt, overcome doubt in this story. But it isn't always easy. Because sometimes when things seem bleak, it's hard for me to overcome the doubts. When I've continually failed and fallen in sin, and I I've turned my back on God, why wouldn't I doubt myself to overcome temptation? Why wouldn't I doubt my abilities to help me stay faithful? When my trust is lower in other people, it's hard for me to overcome doubts because I don't trust that others can actually help me in any way. I don't trust my coworkers, and I, I constantly feel the need to check up on them and what they're doing. I don't trust my family, and I feel like every act they do is to push me away or to, to tear me down. I don't trust in God's message, and, and I doubt that he's going to save my life. And these doubts just continue to build up and build up. And eventually, if my trust is not at a level it needs to be, those doubts will take me away from God and from salvation. But yet, when we look at this story, when you see how trust overcomes doubts, we see how it's beneficial for our faith. Because when I look at this story, 
then I can begin to rebuild my strength or my trust and overcome those doubts I may have because I know that God's people he has put around me are there to help me. Overcoming doubt with trust allows for growth, both physical and spiritual in relationships. Physically, if I'm overcoming the doubt I have about a project being done or, or someone helping me in a physical trial, then I am trusting in that relationship. And that relationship will, will flourish under that trust. And spiritually, that means that if God is, is, is taking care of me, and I trust that God is taking care of me, that when those trials come, I'll overcome doubts I have about falling or ever being forgiven. Overcoming doubts helps me to spiritually strengthen myself. And we should learn that from this story here in, in 2 Kings chapter 4. I can see how this has helped me in my own life. When I trust in experiences and examples of others and the wisdom they have from their experiences, then I learn from it. And it helps me to overcome doubts that I'm not alone in my struggles or in my sin. I see others who have overcome and, and gone out on the other side of that struggle. And I know that their wisdom can help me in that same aspect. When I trust in God, it helps me overcome doubts that, I, that I've had before, that I'm too flawed to be saved, that I can't ever become what God wants me to be. And yet when I look at the examples of those he has saved, Paul, Matthew, Peter, God saved people who have done terrible things, and he's put them to work for his kingdom. And I know that God can do the same for me. Trusting in others to overcome doubt helps me to grow in all aspects of my relationships. And it's a lesson taught to us by this Shunammite woman. But finally, and perhaps most importantly, we see the final lesson in this story. And that's trust saves. If you look with me in verse 38. Or I apologize in verse 32. When Elisha came to the house, he saw the child lying dead on the bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child putting his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she had came to him, he said, Pick up your son. Then she came and fell at his feet, bowing down to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. Trust saves, physically and spiritually. In this story, we see that, that trust saves this child. The Shunammite woman trusts that Elisha can do it. Elisha trusts that God will do it. And it all happens. After Gehazi's attempts to heal the child fails, Elisha then goes to the child. The Shunammite woman trusts in Elisha's ability to save, and Elisha trusts in God working through him. Elisha goes up to the room where the child's laying and stays in the room by himself. He prays to God for the child. He asks God for help because he trusts that God's power and authority and salvation and saving power will fall upon this child. God does do that. He saves the child. And again, that reassures the idea of trust that Elisha has, proving that trust does save. Trust saves, but we still wrestle with this idea. How can something that we don't see or feel or touch save us? How can someone that I, I can't have a back and forth conversation with save me? How can reading through a book and trusting in what it says save me? They're all questions we may have asked ourselves when our faith or our trust falters. I know I've had these questions run through my head. I, I know I've had these doubts. Because it's difficult sometimes to trust in what we cannot physically touch. These are struggles that we have to, or that we have in our faith. But yet they're the struggles that over overcome with trust. Because if our trust is going to grow in God, we have to know he will save us. So when we have these struggles, we have to look at what he's done. And no greater example is, is through his son or just through his word, where we have so many different examples of, of him keeping prophecies he has made, of him saving people who have, who have died, of him answering prayers in, his, in, in the word. And that's beneficial for us. That's beneficial for our trust of God. Because if I know that my faith saves me, I can go every day with confidence in that salvation. I can go every day knowing that if I am obedient and faithful to God and his word, he will lift me up and save me in that last day. We see examples of trust being the reason for salvation throughout the Bible. And trust is just another word for faith. 
But in Luke 7, 43, Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, she gave, yet, or you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Jesus saves this woman who comes and washes his feet because she has faith that if she comes in and it shows this humility and this kindness to Jesus, he will forgive her, he will lift her up, and he will save her. That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus has done for us. And we continue to see this lesson taught in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're saved because God has given us a gift. A gift of grace, a gift of kindness. And that's a wonderful thing. And we can trust in that because we have seen and, and, and read and known about how God does that. Finally, in James chapter 5, we read this. And the prayer of the faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is great power, as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Prayer of a trusting disciple works. Prayer of someone who trusts in God's ability will save him. And that's what we need to understand, that when we trust in God, we will be saved. We will be saved because of that trust in his power. That means I look towards God when I'm struggling in sin, trusting in his guidance to lead me out of it and lead me where I need to be. It means I trust in him even when it seems like life is difficult, when things aren't going right. I trust that God is there to care for me. This means I trust in him even if my struggles, even if my, my weak weaknesses are telling me not to. Knowing that trust saves brings about a confidence and a hope so that I can constantly rely on God for salvation. Trust saves. The Shunammite woman, and this lesson about the bed and breakfast she has, teaches us some strong lessons about the importance of trust. Without trust, our lives are dark and harsh. Without trust, we feel alone and lost. Without trust, we are spiritually dead. Trust saves. And if trust saves, then my trust in God is forth far more than anything else that might come about in my life. Trust is what matters in our discipleship. I appreciate you joining us this morning for our worship service. I hope that you'll join us again on Wednesday night when we go ahead and study in Daniel and continue that study that we're having. Thank you again for your attention.